but in his interpretation. It's as good a break time as any. Hey everyone, it's me, Mike. Welcome to a wicked book. It's the end of chapter three and we're snug as a bug in a rug with our new bedmate and best pal. But before we call it a night, let's have a little bedtime chat about the Spouter Inn and about all the cool, funny things that happen inside. At first glance, this chapter might not seem as dense or imbued with meaning as the ones that came before. It's not packed with references and philosophical asides. That said, if we peel back the layers of this spouter in, we'll find that although it is a very funny chapter and features Ishmael at points acting like a complete lunatic, it also lays bare some of the core themes and ideas that Ishmael, and by extension, Melville are going to grapple with for the rest of this book, starting with three full paragraphs about what Ishmael calls a boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly. The painting in the Spouter Inn has been the subject of infinite discussion, speculation, and interpretation. First, there's the question of what is the painting of? Ishmael's description of the painting doesn't say, it's a big ship fighting an angry whale. It says, such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows, and a long, limber, portentous, black mass of something hovering over over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines. The real subject of the painting is left completely unresolved. It creates a similar ambiguity to chapter one's Call Me Ishmael. Just as each of us needs to have a theory about who Ishmael is, we also need to form in our minds an idea of what this painting is. Ishmael sees in the painting a ship and a whale locked in mortal combat. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane, and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft, is in the enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads. But that's Ishmael's interpretation, a final theory of my own, partly based upon the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed upon the subject. Ishmael, who we know is an experienced whaler, and the people whose opinions he's gathered, who spend their time in a place like the Spouter Inn, and are probably whalers themselves, of course they see a whale! What else could they see? In a clouded, abstract mess of a painting, everybody sees what they want to see. It's the same thing as looking in a mirror. The painting can only show you yourself. I might look into that painting right now and see The Legend of Zelda, because that's all I can think about right now. It is totally up to the viewer. That is the literal what's on the canvas part of the painting. Then there's the question of what does the painting mean? The most obvious interpretation is that it's a foreshadowing device. Ishmael sees a fight to the death because that is where he and we are headed in this book. A climactic confrontation with a monstrous whale. Also, as more and more people have come to study Moby Dick, the painting has become something of a metaphor for the book itself. It was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it that you could anyway arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Just like the book that has spawned a million term papers and at least one YouTube channel, the painting demands repeated visits and dedicated study. Or the painting could represent the character of Ishmael. We know he's trying to find his place in the world. We have hints that he might be an outcast or without an identity, and this whirling, inscrutable painting could reflect the turmoil of Ish trying to figure out who he really is and where he belongs. There's something else going on here. There are two Ishmaels in this story. There's the Ishmael we are reading about, who is off on his first whaling journey, and there's the Ishmael who's telling us this story. An Ishmael who's much older and more experienced, and who knows everything that's about to happen to the younger version of himself. He's seen the end of this story, and there's an argument to be made that the voyage young Ishmael is about to undertake traumatizes him so deeply that he spends the rest of his life trying to come to terms with it, primarily by writing this book, as if gathering and documenting everything there is to say about whales and 
wailing will allow him to finally comprehend what happened to him. The older Ishmael is obsessively chasing understanding, just like Ahab obsessively chases the whale. And what we're reading is the artifact of that obsession. His description of the painting is where we first start to feel the split between the two Ishmaels. Because in the story, this is Ishmael's first time visiting the Spouter Inn. But in his interpretation of the painting, he tells us he's been back to visit many times. A series of systematic visits. Moving on from the painting, because we must, we next find ourselves faced with one of the major themes of Moby Dick. The space between what is civilized and uncivilized. Between Christianity and paganism. Between modern and unmodern. Ish describes the Spouter Inn as being decorated with a bunch of weapons. The opposite wall of this entry was hung all over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. Let's stop on heathenish for a minute. Moby Dick is kind of a racist book. There is no getting around it. Some of the language Melville uses, or the way he describes or writes certain characters, is not cool. Ishmael uses words like heathen or savage as synonyms for scary. And in a lot of cases, what he's referring to is anything that doesn't feel immediately familiar in a white Christian world. To Ishmael's credit, he spends a lot of time examining and knocking down his own prejudices about what he considers heathenish and whether being a heathen is at all a bad thing. We'll see that in just a bit when he meets the Harpooner. And a common defense of Moby Dick is that for its time, it was actually pretty progressive. But that doesn't change the book being what it is, or excuse what it does wrong. I'm probably not the best person to approach this book with the intent of understanding its treatment of race and drawing any kind of conclusion. I think the only real way to do that, and to do it right would be to dismantle the entire book from end to end with that specific lens in mind. For our purposes, I'll make note of it where it comes up, but I'm also going to try to keep this pretty broad. On the subject of race, though, there is one massive question about Moby Dick, and now's as good a time as any to ask it, is Ishmael white. He's never described to us. The biblical Ishmael's mother was a handmaiden, not the woman his father was married to. And there are strong hints throughout this book that our Ishmael, who maybe comes from a fine family, is a pariah. It's not a massive leap to imagine that our Ishmael shares a similar story to the biblical one, and is possibly, as a result, mixed race, which in his era, and still would be a very isolating experience. It might explain Ishmael's tendency to consider and challenge his own prejudices because he faces so many himself. Skin is talked about frequently in this book, and Ishmael often ruminates on the differences between what we can see on the surface and the truth that's hidden underneath which often only reveals itself, again, with systematic visits and careful study. Yeah, we're still talking about the painting. The next bit of this chapter is not super heavy. Basically, Ishmael asks to get a room, and the landlord tells him the inn is full, and he'll need to share a bed with a harpooner. And what happens for the next few pages is a comedy of errors. First, Ishmael tries at length to make a bed from a bench, but no matter how he positions it, or moves it around, or tries tries to combine it with other furniture, it won't work. Which could also be a metaphor for Ishmael trying to find his place in the world. Then him and the landlord do an Abbott and Costello bit about the harpooner trying to sell his own head, which concludes in one of my favorite moments in this entire book, where Ishmael completely loses his mind and threatens to sue the landlord. And in the first place, you will be so good as to unsay that story about selling his head, which I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with the madman, and you, sir, you, I mean 
landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly, would thereby render yourself liable to a criminal prosecution. Just imagine him carrying it up in the spouter in, shouting at little old Peter Coffin. Oh, and a side note, at one point during the night, a bunch of rowdy sailors show up, fresh off a whaling voyage. With them is a guy named Bulkington, who Ish says will later join us on the ship and our whaling trip. This man interested me at once, and since the sea gods had ordained that he should soon become my shipmate. We're gonna find Melville does this frequently. He wrenches the story to a halt to give us a mountain of detail about something he says is important, and then either never or barely brings it up again. Based on Ishmael's introduction and the time he spent in this moment to describe Bulkington to us, you would think he's a major character in this book, but he isn't. The name Bulkington appears eight times in Moby Dick. For reference, it has appeared three times in this video. We will meet him one more time in one more chapter and never hear about him again. Get used to it. Back to Ishmael. His being tired and cold has led him to reevaluate his feelings about this mysterious harpooner. Seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night unless in some other person's bed, I began to think that, after all, I might be cherishing unwarrantable prejudices against this unknown harpooner. It's funny to see Ishmael's circumstances changing his perception, the same way he talked about in the previous chapter. Just like Lazarus, who would take almost any alternative to sleeping in the ice-cold street, Ishmael has now reasoned himself into sharing a bed with a stranger. And so he heads up to the room, where he immediately starts snooping through the harpooner's things, which includes a moment where he tries on the harpooner's clothes and scares himself so badly in the mirror that he leaps out of them. Finally, he goes to bed, and just as he's dozing off, in walks Queequeg, the harpooner, and our soon-to-be best friend. At first, Ishmael is kind of terrified of him. He talks about his tattoos and his skin color and his heathenish ways. Like we said before, one of Ishmael's primary struggles in this book is around what people consider civilized and uncivilized, and why. He thinks Queequeg a savage, but he also tries to challenge his own assumptions. And what is it, thought I? After all, it's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin. He's suspicious and scared. And some of that is reasonable. After all, Queequeg is a stranger who takes his tomahawk to bed. But a lot of the fear is driven by ignorance, which Ishmael himself admits. Ignorance is the parent of fear. And on the tattoos, I remembered a story of a white man, a whaleman too, who, falling among the cannibals, had been tattooed by them. It's an interesting aside, because we learn later that Ishmael, or at least the older, more experienced Ishmael who's writing this account, is covered in tattoos. And if we add this to the thought that he might be mixed race, what we can see is a man who walks between two worlds. One civilized, or modern, or white, and the other uncivilized. Not modern, not white. And what we know about Ishmael is that the more learned, possibly not white, and less ignorant Ishmael doesn't seem to agree that white and modern and Christian are the same thing as civilized and good. In fact, his experience has often shown him the opposite. And a lot of that starts in this room with Queequeg. The best thing about this segment is that while Ishmael's having this philosophical discussion with himself, he's slowly running out of time to announce that he's in this guy's bed. And then when Queequeg finally jumps in, it creates such a fracas that Ishmael is literally screaming for help. But in the end, Ish is able to calm himself by again wrestling with his preconceived notion of what savage means 
means. The man's a human being just as I am. He has just as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Better to sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. And then he sleeps like a stone. That ought to do it for this spouter in. Our two best pals should be waking up soon with full hearts and empty bellies. Next week, we'll cover chapters four, five, and six, The Counterpane, Breakfast, and The Street. Remember, if you like what you're seeing here, like, subscribe, comment, and May Patreon rewards are coming up quick. Until I see you again, please be good, be kind, don't kick any puppies, and thanks for watching. Before you go, here's my question for you this week. When you look into the painting at the Spouter Inn, what do you see?